Let's start with a practical one. How do you, in practice, use nanotechnology to build up the sort of um, circuit that you showed? I mean, mm. you mentioned silver wires. How, how do you do it? That's a really good question. Um, so in nanotechnology, there are two approaches. One approach is called top-down fabrication, and that's basically where you have a clean room to make really small devices. And this is how you make computer chips, for example. So Intel, for example, has these massive clean room facilities where they do what's called fabrication to make their nanotechnology devices, small, small chips. But there's another nanotechnology approach which is called bottom-up synthesis. And this is mostly what you do in a chemistry lab. So you bring some molecules together with the different types of materials that you're interested and what happens with those molecules is that they form different chemical bonds. And that kind of approach is called self-assembly. And that's exactly the kind of approach that these silver nanowires um, was used to, to make that kind of network. It was self-assembly of all the molecules that are needed to make these kind of nanowires. And it's interesting how you can actually make different types of structures, not just wires, but other types of structures as well from this type of approach. Okay, so who's doing it? Mm. Companies, university groups, who, who's actually yeah, so involved a, in yeah, this a, and a, where are they? Sure, yeah, it's a bit of everyone, I guess. So um, I've shown you one company, NEC, which is a Japanese company that's commercialised this atomic switch technology for their particular um, applications, which I mentioned was for space communications. Um, myself, um, I'm working with groups in Japan, so I'm working with the group that originally developed the atomic switch that has now been um, commercialised by NEC. Um, and NEC's interest was really more around the uh, computing um, and software side of things, whereas our approach is really much more around developing for the neuromorphic type of you know, synthetic brain approach. Um, this particular collaboration with Japan also involves a collaboration with the University of California um, at Los Angeles as well. Um, and they have unique labs both there um, and in Japan as well. Uh, and my own work, what I do, is I actually make computer simulations of these networks. And that's really important because for any device that you want to make, um, it can be very labour intensive to do it all in the lab and do trial and error type of experiments. So ideally what you'd like to be able to do is to make in experiments in silico to simulate the device that you're trying to make. And then you can actually run through a whole range of different scenarios and you can optimise the device design to, um, to a point where it's starting to exhibit things that you want to see, and then you can use that device, optimised device design and give it to the people in the lab and say, right, build this according to this blueprint. Okay. So how do you, when you're simulating it, and then how, when they make it in the lab, I mean, you showed this amazing tangle that looks, as yeah. you said, very like yep. a picture of um, the real brain, but in metal rather than yes, exactly. biological Organic, yeah. molecules. How... How do you actually get them to grow in that way if it's bottom-up synthesis? How, how do you do it? Yeah, so you mean in terms of the computer simulation or, well, or in, in practice? Either. Yeah. Either. Yeah, so um, one of the... So um, I'll talk first about the experimental side of things. So um, one of the advantages of using this technique, this nanotechnology technique called self-assembly, is that... It does it on its own. So every time you create a new network, it creates a completely different structure. Um, that's an advantage for our particular application, looking at a neuromorphic device, because, of course, we do want to try and produce a whole range of different types of networks um, and see the range of different properties and functions that they exhibit, because everybody's brain is different. Um, when we try and simulate this with a computer model, which is what I do, um, there are actually clever ways to set up networks in computer models. Um, and as a physicist, I am actually interested in simulating the physics that happens at the individual junctions. There's actually some really interesting physics there, including quantum tunnelling, which we have to put into the models. Um, and that presents an interesting aspect as well, because um, you, know, you can think about 
well, what happens if you put quantum tunneling in there or you don't? Do you get different properties coming out of the network? You know, so we can actually explore those kind of questions with the computational modelling. But another interesting aspect of the computational modelling um, is what I alluded to through my talk, and that is the network behaviour. So whenever you have a complex system, you always get the effect of the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And that arises simply because of all the connections between the individual components. And that's what's really exciting when you're able to simulate this, to try and see the richness of the different types of behaviours that emerge as a result of the network itself. Um, when you're developing a new computer architecture, a new form of computing, whether it's this or quantum computing, mm -hmm. there are two issues. One is the hardware, building the structure, and then how the hell do you program it? That's a huge problem, isn't that's, it? That's right. And look, um, so for the devices that we're trying to make, a synthetic intelligence device or a synthetic brain device, the whole point about this is that ideally we don't want to program it. We want to teach it, we want it to learn things, but we want to try and make sure that it does it on its own as much as possible. You can think of it as the way in which you would bring up a child. You know, you start with these small steps, you teach it how to read, how to write, how to walk, you know, do all those kind of, maybe not walking in, in this context, <laughs> but you know what I mean. So we want to try and train it, we want to try and learn it, and then at some point it should start to be doing things on its own. So that's... That's a major distinction between this approach and the AI approach, where with the AI software-based approach, you always have to program it. You always have to provide it with data and pre-programming. Um, OK, so just to pursue that, so mm. how, how, would you do, how would you teach it? How would you get it going so that it does teach itself and learn? Yeah, that's right. So, so I showed you a very rudimentary um, test. It was an associative learning test where we got the device to reproduce these digits that we were feeding it with spatial coordinates that represented a two and a one. So we're thinking about new ways in which we can test the device and also teach it different things. Um, so to do that, we're actually um, collaborating with neuroscientists and psychologists because they come up with these sorts of tests all the time that they apply to real people. Um, so we're hoping that we can actually devise some learning tests that demonstrate um, learning and, and also memory as well, different types um, of memory. So, yeah. And why are you using nanotechnology with inorganic materials um, as opposed to actually um, using biological molecules and growing a brain? And as you know, mini brains are now all the rage in some That's, areas. Yeah. What, what does this offer that growing, simulating the brain more directly with biological yeah. organic chemistry? Why? Yeah. Why, why this? <laughs> the simple but perhaps unsatisfying answer to that is simply that biology is so messy. You know, <laughs> I'm not a biologist, um, but to try and make your own biological things, synthetic biology, it's actually really, really hard to do. It's a lot easier to make things with well-known, um, you know, inorganic uh, materials. You have much more control over the structure and the function that that, that they form. So that's our first step. Whether further down the track a biologist gets involved and has some interesting ideas to, you know, evolve that further, we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Yes, I mean, you could imagine a hybrid, a sort of cyborg type approach. Indeed, I imagine. yeah. And what's the, what's your idea of the sort of timing? You were talk, looking ahead, I mean, how far advanced is, is this? Yeah, so we're working on this right now. And, um, you know, we're, we're hoping that in the next few years we'll have... Like, so we have a prototype at the moment, but we're hoping that in the next few years we'll have a better type, prototype. So as I mentioned, um, one of my um, uh, roles in this particular aspect is actually to develop um, computer simulations of the device uh, with a goal to optimise it and then build another prototype that works better um, and, and just to keep doing that. But 
um, we're hoping we'll have another prototype within the next few years that will be better than the one that we, we have now and hope to continuously improve it. But one of my colleagues at the University of Sydney, he's a roboticist, um, and he's already said to me, whenever you have a prototype, bring it over and I'll put it into one of my systems and we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, I think I'm ready to start taking quest lots for people, as I knew that would be brilliant. Um, we'll start in the middle, but I don't worry, I won't ignore the sides. Um. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've, if one reads The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, you've got Marvin, the paranoid android. <laughs> so if you've got a, an artificial... Uh, intelligence system or a synthetic intelligence system, how do we know it's not going to have a nervous breakdown? <laughs> so, um, I have deliberately avoided making the distinction between emotional intelligence and the other form of intelligence. <laughs> so, emotional intelligence is a different kettle of fish and, of course, ultimately that's going to be what distinguishes us from something that's synthetic. Yeah. Hi. Uh, question. Uh, speaking about emergent phenomena, um, the human being one and uh, consequently the brain, what is the correlation between um, not only intelligence but consciousness with uh, the actual biological body? Because it does work, the proteins and things that get involved in. That's right. Look, that's a great question and a lot of people, um, both neuroscientists and physicists, are, are actually addressing that That question in, in, um, in various types of research being done. So consciousness, um, as we understand it, is a state of mind. And we don't know yet what makes the human mind unique in that we are all conscious. Um, some of the research that's being done by neuroscientists have been able to identify that consciousness, which involves both awareness and arousal, and actually originates from two different parts of the brain. One is the hippocampus, which is sort of down there, the back of the brain stem there, and the other one is in the cortex. Now, importantly, it's not just one region, it's at least two. And so this comes back to this point where the brain needs to be considered as a whole. It's a, it's a complex thing, and things are connected a, across the brain. It probably involves more than two regions, realistically. So... In my opinion, this thing about consciousness really has to do with the connections that are made across the brain in, in, in different areas. Um, you know, we really have to appeal to the neuroscientists as well to keep doing the research that they're doing to, to understand this better. But it is a great question, you know, what is it? And one of the things that we're hoping to study with, with our device is that if we just think of consciousness as a different brain state, so, you know, you can imagine being awake and alert and having <coughs> information being received, and then there's another state where you're sleeping, and then there's another state where you're in a coma, you know, the brain is still functioning at some level, but obviously you're not conscious. So um, one question that we'd like to, to be able to address is can we actually replicate that, those different states, different thinking states or awareness states with an artificial device that we make? That's a, I mean, that's a really important point that um, neuroscience and synthetic intelligence work will really play off each other and learn from each other, as, as you're suggesting. Yeah. I'll take one more in the middle, then I'll go to a side. Just, um... Thank you very much. Fascinating talk. But I must Please. confess that the most interesting part of it for me was how much energy my Google search uses. I had absolutely <laughs> no idea. And, um, and that made me think, aren't we really better off... Um, uh, improving human intelligence <laughs> than concentrating on synthetic one. We're talking about colonizing the moon and not taking care of our own planet. So just, just thought to mention yeah, that. It's Thank a good you. comment, yeah, a fair comment. Okay, so this gentleman on this side. I was interested in the three-dimensional structure that you had there. I'm a chemist. Mm. And looking at that, you had the biological of the brain. How many connections are there to each synapse? 
And would it not be better to have an actual regular structure rather than this sort of random thing that we've got in our brains? Looking at it, if you had a synapse with eight connections and you just keep replicating that all the time, is that not the best way to pack Well, actually, the thing that's into a really a good, good question. Space? So, of course, our biological brains um, have evolved over millions of years. So the fact that they've evolved into this kind of random complex structure means that for whatever reason, that must be an optimal structure. But what's really interesting is that um, for the research groups that are working on neuromorphic chips, for example, IBM, um, each one of their chips, they actually put on a circuit board and they put them into a regular arrangement, you know. And they cannot replicate the same types of neuromorphic behaviours that are seen from the complex structures. Now, to be fair, that wasn't their objective, because their objective was really to create um, a more efficient computing device that's been inspired by the brain. So each of the individual chips consumes much less power than a normal chip would. But what's interesting is th the difference between that regularly arranged system compared to the 3D, you know, complex network system. So that's a great question. You know, for whatever reason, biological evolution has favoured that structure. Yeah? But does it have... What's the equivalent in, in this structure that he was asking about of the neurotransmitters? You have... I mean, is, are there actually ions passing across yes. these, syn yeah. these synapses? Yeah, there, there are. So in, in the complex network structure... Um, so wherever the wires overlap, and there are a lot of overlapping mm. wire sections, they form uh, an electrical junction. So um, there's, a, there's a metal. So I didn't mention this, but the metals actually are wrapped with an insulator. So you have a, a metal, and then an insulating layer, and then a metal. And so when you get a voltage bias across that, it actually drags ions from one side over to the other. And so you get this, you know, sort of train of ions forming across, and that forms a conductive path. And that creates this kind of switch-like behaviour where the system turns on. What, what are the ions for the chemists amongst us? Well, for the silver nanowires, the silver, silver ions. So, okay. yeah. <laughs> OK. Um, yes, lady up there. I was wondering, is there a necessity? And if so, is there a plan for trying to replicate the dynamic nature of the actual brain? So are you going to have the, the nanowires set in stone or are they going to change? Yeah, look, that's a really good question. So, um, uh, you know, synaptic plasticity is where you get really all the dynamics um, coming through. And at the moment, we can't physically change the structure of those nanowires. So at the moment, the only thing that's changing dynamically is where all the connections are taking place. So the, the nanowires, once we've made one network, stay in place. Um, but when we, put, when we um, stimulate it with different electrical stimuli, you can see different areas or different overlaps where the junctions form that become active. So those are the dynamics as we have them at the moment. There's no physical movement of but the wires. are there plans to put in motion to allow some sort of growth and development as we... Yeah, be so um, one of the things that we're looking at at the moment is to um, try and get these wires to grow in a different type of material, sort of something that's more amorphous. So we think that, you know, at, at the moment what they've been grown in is a lot more solid, so they're probably fixed in that. So if we put them in something that's a bit more amorphous, then maybe we might start to see them moving around a bit. We don't know yet, but... That, that, might, that might work. Sure, thank yeah. you. What sort of scale are they? You, are you, did you put, I can't remember if you, there was a dimension on Yeah, the so, so the individual nanowires are probably between 50 to, to 100 nanometers in, okay. in width, but their length can be, you know, a micron scale. And the size of a whole network for the prototypes that we have at the moment are typically around about 100 microns. Uh, 100 microns, you know, sort of squarish. Yes. Um, so even though the things that they're made up of are nanoscale structures, the whole network itself is a much larger scale. Up on the end there. So when we create these networks to create intelligence, how do we know we won't accidentally create emotional intelligence? Ah. <laughs> 
don't and would it matter if we know. did? <laughs> yeah, I don't know because we, we, you know, we don't know what emotional intelligence is. Um, we don't know if we're going to create a paranoid android. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, that, that's a great question, and um, I don't know what the answer is. Yeah, <laughs> any psychologists in the room? Maybe you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you seem to imply that. Uh, Neural networks and other kinds of artificial intelligence would seem to have no role when it, as a result of synthetic intelligence. But it seems to me that while synthetic intelligence would be useful for some applications, mm. for some uses it would be still more appropriate to have like data ba data based neural networks rather than uh, more brain like. Synthetic intelligence. Yeah, look, you're absolutely right, and that's a that's a great point. You know, anything that's going to require um, churning through large amounts of data, which is something that the human brain can't really do. You know, we need computers to do that. So we're still going to need those AI software-based approaches to do those kind of things. You're absolutely right. And where will quantum computer computing come in then? Oh, this is the $64,000 <laughs> question, is it? When and what, what will it yeah. look like? So, um, look, there are already some rudimentary quantum computers that, you know, are sitting yes. in, in labs. Um, but, um, you know, when they're really going to come to the fore, um, I don't know. And, look, the, the power consumption applies to them as well because yes. quantum computers are also being made out of... Um, some very expensive components, and they're, they're going to consume even more power than you know conventional computers because of the additional because of the additional requirements that you that are needed to control what they're made out of at, at that level. You need to cool things down considerably. Um, so um, yeah, they're very power hungry as well. Yes, sir. Coming back on your on the plasticity uh, question. Mm. Um, don't you need the plasticity to learn? And so you're trying to teach something which, in fact, cannot learn if you basically don't have the plasticity. So how do you manage at all to, to teach anything? Oh, well, to, at some level, we do have some plasticity because um, what we're seeing with the network is that when we stimulate it in different ways, we're seeing uh, different connections happening. Um, we're seeing different dynamics in the way that those connections change. So we, we stimulate it with different um, electrical stimulations, different um, temporal stimulations, different, different rates and that sort of thing. And we can then um, assess all the different ways in which the networks, uh, the network can actually um, uh, establish those different connections as well. So we do see some level of synaptic plasticity in terms of the dynamics. Um, but, as was pointed out before, um, because the physical system as we have it at the moment is not changing, we're not growing new wires, um, so we, we can't, you know, um, grow new neurons or indeed prune, you know, neurons as well, which is what the brain does as well. So, um, so those are the limitations at the moment. Yeah. I'll work back. <laughs> Your talk was absolutely uh, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the technology you've talked about is both exciting and, in my view, also terrifying. And, and in response to the question about emotional intelligence, you sort of you laugh it off as well. You know, we don't know, but actually. Are we so, sort of talking about a, a Frankenstein scenario here and, and how do you manage the responsibility to yeah. understand whether we're creating something that one day will look at us and to, to the point the lady made there. Objectively, we are very bad for this planet mm. and an intelligent, thinking, non-emotional uh, machine may say, hmm. I need to do something about this. Yeah, no, it's, it is a great point. It is a great point. And look, um, there's two things I want to say about that. So firstly, emotional intelligence in humans is really, really imp important. We use emotions to make our decisions. No matter how rational or logical we think we are, all our decisions are made emotionally. So that is always going to be the difference between us and an AI or a synthetic intelligence, you know. Um, the second point is, um, so, 
Um, so as I said, you know, we don't know we don't know what emotion is. We don't know how how it emerges. Um, so um, yes, if we suddenly discovered that in the lab we created something that has this emotional intelligence. Um, you know, whether that's going to be a good thing or a bad thing, I, I don't know. But as we're seeing now with AI, um, we're understanding how important it is to establish some ethical regulations around the technologies that we're now starting to realise. And we're starting to realise these technologies with an ever-increasing pace. That, to me, is probably the most... Um, challenging aspect, the rate at which we're seeing these happens right before our very eyes, within our own generations, you know. So it is absolutely important that we address the ethical questions um, and the regulatory um, boundaries that need to be put in place for any new technologies, you know, the AI, the synthetic intelligence and whatever else comes out of this. Um, yeah. Great question. If we can fully achieve synthetic intelligence, does this begin to give evidence about the... Um, uh. I <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. And does this begin to give evidence about the computational hypothesis that it doesn't matter about our biology, it's just how we interact? And if so, does that mean, like, ambitiously speaking, we could do the reverse of what you're trying to do and, like, upload ourselves into something virtual? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, look, um, I suspect that, you know, as with all research, you start out with a question that you want to address. You think, oh, yeah, I want to find out about this, I'm going to do that. And then along the way, you discover something completely different, and that's the real discovery. So I've talked to you today about something that I'm interested in and something I'm actively involved in at the moment, and I think we're moving towards <laughs> realising this, but actually, along the way, what are we going to find out? We're probably going to find out other things. Maybe it's going to be emotional intelligence. Maybe it's going to be something about how humans as biological entities can interface with non-biological entities. You know, that's what discovery is. It's about doing something with something in mind, but then along the way, you have these moments where, oh, hang on, what, what's this, you know? So, yeah, it's possible. Yeah. yeah. No <laughs> mic's coming, because it's all being recorded for posterity, for playing on the RI YouTube time. channel later. Yeah. Hello, thank you for a fascinating talk. Is it the case that every creature on the planet that exhibits any kind of what we know as intelligent behavior has neurons and synapses. If that is true, what are they doing? Are mm. we at danger of missing the big picture? The analogy would be we're trying to understand flight and aerodynamics and we're building a fabulous model of a feather and missing <laughs> the real theory. And if you do have any clues about that theory, there's one other thing I understand that all intelligent life seems to have in common, and that, that is we all sleep. Mm. And sleep seems such a crazy thing to do that yeah. if it was possible to avoid it, evolution would have found a way of avoiding it. So I suppose, I don't have a lot of questions in there, but is there a theory? Have you, have you seen any clue about sleep? What do, what do oh, they look, do? Oh, look, there's a lot of research being done on sleep. Um, Less so in this specific context of, you know, I intelligence, for example. But just to answer your first question, yes, animals also have neurons. Um, their, their brains are, are different. Um, and so, again, this speaks to, well, what, what, what is human intelligence? Why, why do we have this thing that we call consciousness and self-awareness where we think animals don't have that? I don't know the answer to that. Um, <laughs> But um, with regards to the second part of your question about sleep, that kind of links back to this idea of, okay, the brain has different thinking states. You know, the, the awake state, there's a sleep state, there's a, you know, coma state where we no longer have consciousness. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's an absolutely interesting question and it's... You know, there's a lot of research being done on real people to try and answer that question. But 
again, you know, if we had a device that could maybe provide a different perspective on that, maybe different types of information that we've not been able to garner before because we haven't been able to do the right kind of experiments on, on real people, then that might provide some new information that can shed light onto that question. I was wondering if you could elaborate on your the modelling you're doing. Um, are you modelling it, the synapses or the system, as an excitable system? And if so, how do you encode uh, information to that rather than just being a excited or um, relaxed? Yeah, so there's two aspects to the modelling. So one is modelling the individual synapses, if you like, and I've kind of mentioned a little bit about you know, what's involved in there because there's some interesting physics that occurs at the junctions between the nanowires. Um, the other physics that, you know, there's laws of physics that you need to include in there to make sure everything is working as a physical process. So there's things, I don't know if you know how much physics you know, but there's just things like Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's law, things like that. So you have to make sure that you're modelling that correctly at all the junctions, because at the end of the day, we're modelling it like it's um, um, an electronic network. The difference is it's not a normal network because everything is very complex. So we have that network complexity built into it. So at the individual junction level, we model the physics of what's happening to the current, the voltage, the conductance at the individual junction. But we also have everything connected in this complex network level. So um, everything needs to be consistent at the network level itself. The way we do this is with differential equations. So we have a whole bunch of differential equations um, that describes every single junction in the network. Um, and it just depends on the size of the network that we happen to be modeling. You know, some of the sizes we have over 1,000 junctions. Sometimes we have 200 junctions. So we have a differential equation for every single one of those, and it needs to be solved simultaneously. Um, and there are just, you know, you, there are ways you can do that, so it's, you know, it's not rocket science or anything, but that's how we do it in practice. Um, yeah, I didn't know if that answers your question okay. there. Yes, row behind and then back to... Do you think there will be a way for a synthetic brain to interpret sound or more likely to develop a taste for music, for example? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I guess it's kind you know, it's... Um, it's somewhat related to the emotional intelligence question because now we're talking about creativity, which is another distinctly human trait that I don't know how we would ever emulate that in, in a device. But let's think about sound, for example. So sound goes into our eardrums and inside there there's a transducer that converts it to an electrical signal that then goes to the brain. So... Maybe, in principle, we could try and emulate that in a, in a device as well. And then, of course, the next question, which is the more interesting one, how do you go from that to getting the device to appreciate music or to make its own music? I don't know if that's, you know, conceivable <laughs> or not. Yeah. Maybe that can be a way to actually uh, make emotional intelligence. Possibly, yeah. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. On, on the question of memory, you gave the example of a memory, uh, the number one, I think. Oh, yeah, stored. yeah, yeah. Does, does the memory scale in, in a similar way to um, a real brain? And is, is it sort of more robust as well? That, that it, I wouldn't say that because the prototype that we're using at the moment is pretty... It's pretty primitive in that sense, so I wouldn't go so far as to say that we would be able to scale that with, with the brain. Um, and, you know, there's a lot more work that needs to be done before we can really start making those direct um, comparisons. But, but is, is it distributed, the, the memory? Then? Yes, uh, yes it is. Right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, a fabulous talk. Um, going back to Douglas Adams, and, <laughs> and obviously the number 42, um, is there any long game in terms of looking to come up with some big answers to some big questions? Which big answers and questions specifically? Well, <laughs> taking on Einstein to the next level. Um, I'm not sure I really understand what you mean. Uh, can you sort of clarify that? Well, I was that? thinking about where quantum mechanics hits Newton and things like this. Uh, in a synthetic brain? Yeah. 
So, look, so, are you referring to consciousness particularly? I guess that's what it's going to be. <laughs> it's rather, con I mean, it's controversial. It's the very controversial. To which I can tell you what my view. I can tell you what my view is. Um, so, so some people have suggested that quantum entanglement uh, may provide an explanation for consciousness. Um, we have no evidence that that's the case. Um, and, in fact, there's no need to invoke quantum entanglement to explain consciousness, in my view, for, one, for, for the following reason. So, as I've explained, one of the key aspects of the human brain is this... High, it's, it constitutes a highly connected network. And as a result of that complex network, we actually see emergent functionality coming out of that. What emergent functionality is, is as a result of all the interactions, we actually get correlations between different parts of the network. That happens in any complex network. So we can actually get correlations between, on different scales, different parts of the complex network, simply from pure classical physics. We don't need to invoke quantum entanglement. For those of you who are not entirely sure what quantum entanglement means, it means that you have quantum objects, um, usually two or more objects, and they're somehow correlated with each other. So you might have a quantum object over there, it could be something like an electron or a proton or a photon or something, and you have another one over here. And if this one over here does something, the other one does something in a very predictable way because they're correlated with each other um, in a, in, with particular properties. Now. You don't need quantum entanglement, you don't need to invoke quantum entanglement to explain correlations. You have to have a reason for doing that. And at the moment, we have no evidence for it. I don't see any reason for it if you can do it classically, uh, which I think uh, is the case. Now, there's something else I want to say about quantum physics more generally. There are two other quantum phenomena. One is quantum superposition, where something can be in two quantum states at once. That's one. That's one of the bits of physics that's involved in quantum computing, the other one's in entanglement. Quantum superposition, that means in the context of computing, you can be in a zero-bit state or a one, and a one-bit state both at the same time, so instead of being either or. But there's another bit of quantum um, physics that's also interesting, and that's quantum tunnelling. We do have evidence for quantum tunnelling in biological systems. In our own bodies, we have many, many enzyme kinetic reactions happening all the time, all these biochemical reactions occurring that make us alive. And in some cases, those biochemical reactions only proceed because of quantum tunnelling. They wouldn't proceed otherwise. Quantum tunnelling makes them occur, makes them... Um, sidetrack the energy barriers that would otherwise be in place. We have evidence for that, so we can say quantum tunnelling occurs in some biochemical reactions. But okay. for the other ones, <laughs> we'd have no evidence. Evidence. So you said you talked about building a prototype earlier. Hello, I'm here. Oh, thank you. Sarah. <laughs> right. uh, you talked about building a prototype. Um, yeah. If, let's say, in the next five or ten years you were successful, what would you teach it? <laughs> Good question. That's a good question. Um, look, my own personal interest in this, I have two personal interests. One is one I mentioned already, and that is to put these devices into autonomous systems and get them to colonise the Moon and Mars. I see that as being really important, significant um, challenges that we wish to address. Um, another application I'm very interested in, which I didn't mention in my talk, is to create these devices as um, sort of brain interface devices that can be used to help people with dementia, so we can um, restore memory with people in, that have dementia, um, and in some cases also for people with um, learning impairments to help you know, improve whatever um, impairments they might have. And so really, what I would teach this device would depend on the application that I had in mind. Obviously, um, you know, if we were able to use these devices to create um, an, an interface device to help people with dementia, then we'd need to have some kind of specific goals towards 
Uh, maybe it's someone who's lost all short-term memory, or maybe it's someone who's having trouble with long-term memory, or maybe a bit of both. So it would need to be tailored to those particular applications. For the space colonisation applications, again, it would depend on the specific application. So, for example, um, some of you may have heard the news release yesterday about water being discovered on Mars. Um, so, if we were to send devices there, autonomous devices that had some kind of adaptive thinking capability and were able to, um, you know, mine water on their own, then obviously I'd like to be able to teach those devices how to do that particular task or focus on that task. What type of toys can we make with nanotechnology? Ah, oh. That is an awesome <laughs> question. <laughs> You know what? Your imagination is, is the limit. I think you know, there are so many things that you can do with nanotechnology. The reason why there's so much hype about it is because when you reduce things down to nanoscales, they behave completely differently, completely differently. So that's why everyone's so excited, because you just pick something and you say, OK, I'm going to now just look at, at you know, a really tiny nanoscale version of this thing and it'll just give you something completely different that you've never noticed before. Things behave completely differently on the nanoscale and the exciting thing is to discover what those new properties are and then to find new ways of using those properties to create other novel things that can help mankind. Yeah. Great I question. Take a zinging last question from the gentleman patiently in the middle then I'm going to have to stop. Yes, you, sir. Your learning network seems essentially like a, a blank slate. Um, but humans aren't a blank slate. When humans learn, we've got the whole mm. background of evolution mm. um, and a biogrammar, if you like, and, and which determines that when we learn, we become certain kinds of beings. Um, is there any way of adding some kind of constraints like this, some equivalent of an evolution, if you like, or instincts, something like that, or, uh, so that the things aren't just learning, you know, in a completely yeah. blank slate? Yeah, look, that's a really interesting question. Um, and to be honest, I haven't really thought about that before, but I guess, um, you know, just thinking about it on the fly now, you know, with us, it's nature versus nurture. Um, and so, you know, as we grow from being babies and toddlers and children and so on, we find that more and more of what we learn comes from the way in which we interact with our, surround, our surroundings. So even though we don't start with a blank slate, that becomes increasingly less important as we continue to learn. So maybe we could come up with a, with a way of, um, you know, building in some kind of background, I don't know, memory or something like that, but I don't know if it's going to be that important. I'm not sure. Yeah. Gosh, the only bad thing about chairing talks here is uh, there are always so many disappointed people who don't get to ask questions. But So I, I apologise for those who I either didn't see because of the dazzling lights or... Um, but Stenka, that was absolutely fantastic. You responded beautifully to our range of intelligent questions and Thank your you, talk Clive. was fabulous. Thank Thanks you. very much. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you.